All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. This is uh, the webinar Synthetic Computer Vision Data with DeerSig for Enhanced AI Training. So I will get started here. Um, my name is Dan Hedges. I'm a lead, the lead solution architect at Rendered AI, and I'm joined by Matt Robertson, uh, lead solution architect and software senior software engineer at Rendered AI. Um, we are together um, a part of the uh, customer success team here at Rendered, and uh, we are working together to um, to kind of work with our customers to push the uh, bounds of what is capable, what they're capable of uh, with synthetic data. And we're also joined today by Scott Brown, who is a researcher and engineer uh, at the uh, Deers Lab at uh, RIT. And he is the um, he is the leader of the modeling and simulation group there. Um, and so he will be diving a bit more into Deer Six specifically. So for the agenda today, uh, we have uh, I'll be providing an introduction to the rendered AI platform, uh, going over what what its capabilities are, what it's designed for, uh, and then I'll hand it over to Scott for so he can give uh, a more detailed overview of what DeerSig is and, and what it uh, what it can do. And then Matt will talk a bit about uh, the integration of DeerSig within the rendered platform and uh, provide a demo of um, how that uh, how that all will work and how you can use that yourself. So what is rendered AI? Rendered is a uh, platform as a service for generating synthetic data uh, for specific computer vision use cases. So typically our customers come to us because we are the, the shortest path to having uh, uh, computer vision, uh, synthetic computer vision data to train uh, AI models for uh, a wide variety of specific uh, use cases. So. Uh, on the right here are some examples of that. So we, we can work with uh, hyperspectral, multispectral, infrared, um, uh, synthetic aperture radar, a, a wide variety of different um, sensor modalities and uh, different environments and, and, um, and scenarios that, that can work with that. It's a subscription model where uh, you can uh, deploy and, and um, collaborate uh, to uh, generate synthetic data for your specific needs. Uh, and we have uh, in-house uh, expertise in uh, a wide variety of different uh, AI applications. So we were founded because while there's uh, constant uh, innovation in the world of AI, there's still some some big data barriers and, and anyone who's uh, really done much with AI will will tell you that the, the barriers to entry to uh, um, implementing AI are one cost and and time. So it's very expensive to to acquire uh, real data that is is has all the uh, aspects of of what you're looking to train for as, as well as to label it, um, and then uh, the data sets that you do acquire often have have bias, so they're, they're not going to be able to capture the rare objects and, and events that you're you're interested in that uh, that are most important. Then we also work with uh, a, a number of customers that um, that have uh, specific sensors that they're looking to uh, that that maybe don't exist yet or aren't deployed yet, um, and they want to be able to to know what they can do with and and with that data and design those those different data pipelines to be able to um, do what they need uh, they they need their data to do but they just need that that synthetic data to get started and then lastly uh, the one of the big reasons uh, that synthetic data is so powerful is that it's it has um, you know a hundred percent you know uh, accurate labels and and often what we see with with uh, labeling of real data is there's you know there's um, certain types of data that are impossible or or very difficult to to label 
um, and uh, that that inaccuracy can also often uh, negatively impact the the output of the the AI model. So we see that synthetic data solves all, all these problems. So synthetic data is uh, engineered data that an AI model interprets as real and it allows that model to uh, be trained to detect certain things that you're specifically looking for. And because of, this is physics-based, rule-based, rule we can really design what that what that data looks like um, so we can really be fully in control of sort of what sorts of behaviors, uh, what um, what objects and, and events that our AI is looking for. So we see that uh, tomorrow's AI workflow incorporates synthetic data in a way that um, allows us to iterate on the, the effectiveness of, of our AI systems. So um, because it's it's fairly inexpensive, we can do uh, a, a number of, of uh, iterations to to test and experiment with the um, the types of data that we're working with um, and we can bring that in uh, and compare against real data sets um, and also design our um, our systems for edge or or impossible cases now when we talk with customers about synthetic data typically uh, the thinking, the, the initial thinking goes a little bit something like this. So if you um, if you want synthetic data, you, you get a, a good simulator, you generate a synthetic data and everything's everything's hunky dory. You get, a, get an AI model out of it and it's good. But we've what we found is that this this doesn't really work. This this kind of linear mindset uh, for generating synthetic data. Um, and what we've found is that uh, this is more what what using AI uh, synthetic data effectively looks like. So you have um, the the role of what we call synthetic data engineers up here on top. They're in charge of the asset acquisition, building the the um, procedural world generation, uh, and they you know you need that that. A simulator it's a, an important part of of uh, generating synthetic data then you also need kind of a, a framework for the managed compute and, and data set and made it metadata uh, production and, and librarianship uh, and then you need tools for the data scientists to actually go in and configure these data sets uh, do some post-processing and, and domain adaptation and then um, you know, run some tests to measure quality or things like that. And then that can be looped back into the process where these data scientists and synthetic data engineers are working together to um, constantly push the needle forward a, a, a bit with, with every iteration of, of this. So uh, what we see with this setup is uh, more consistent, improved uh, results. So the rendered AI platform has two major parts. So on the bottom here, we have uh, the re repeatable tools and uh, workflow for creating uh, synthetic data and configuring it. So we have developer tools to be able to um, deploy containerized applications for specific use cases. <clears throat> and then from there, that that data, the the use of the platform uh, allows for un, unlimited uh, data set generation, which allows for for um, you know a lot of uh, healthy experimentation with uh, synthetic data, and then some other things like post processing and and um, machine learning integration. Um, and then what we have here on top is are those custom uh, custom applications because each computer vision problem is different uh, in its nature. You want to be able to configure these these solutions to uh, exactly match what you're looking to uh, generate and train for. So these are some of those those kind of examples of of different 
different use cases our customers have had. So one of the examples of these applications that we're, we're going to highlight here is the integration with with uh, DeerSig. DeerSig is a, um, a tool set for simulating uh, remote sensing data. Uh, and it has, a, uh, as Scott is gonna, kind of going to get into, it's, it has a, a long heritage of, of, um, of doing that. So, so we've, we've done this with several of our customers and, um, and we're very excited to kind of share our findings and, um, and uh, get more people uh, the ability to uh, to generate synthetic data using DeerSig uh, and the rendered AI platform. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Scott um, to give us a kind of a, an overview of what what DeerSig is and uh, and yeah, take it away, Scott. All right, thank you, Dan, and, and good morning, everyone. So yeah, DeerSig is um is a renderer just like uh, just like Dan was sort of describing. It's a, it's a fairly unique renderer, we think, in the landscape of available renderers. Like everything else on the rendered platform, uh, they've been targeting having physics-based um, simulators, and DeerSig is a physics-based simulator. And where it differs from many of the other renderers that exist out in the world is that we focus from the start on being a simulation capability. It's been focused on the uh, remote sensing community. So that means that we're trying to focus on the types of acquisitions and the types of sensors that are modeled in the remote sensing community. And historically, the bread and butter sort of users for DeerSig have been sensor designers that are doing just what Dan said, which is they're working on developing um, and eventually deploying a new um, sensing capability. And what they want to be able to do is early in the design to actually be able to trade you know, lenses for lenses and detectors for detectors, et cetera. But increasingly more and more as we move towards a remote sensing community that de doesn't develop just one asset to put um, either up in space or on an aircraft, but tens if not hundreds of these assets, they are exploring far more early this idea of how am I actually going to process this fire hose of data. Um, and so we now um, sort of see uh, this uh, community circling around to, I not only want to be able to optimize sort of the performance of the system, but also the performance of the entire process chain. Um, so anyways, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about DeerSig. There's an awful lot that we won't be able to get into with DeerSig. Um, my slides are littered with example imagery from the DeerSig model. In fact, I can say that all of the images that you will see in my presentation were, were simulated by DeerSig. So let's talk about its history ever so briefly. It's been under development here at RET for um, over 30 years, and I have personally been involved in its development for almost 28 years at this point in time. It is developed by a professional uh, set of developers here at RET that have a background in scientific um, computing, physics, um, you know, computer science, et cetera. It's code that is managed in, in GitLab, um, uses continuous integration, and goes through exhaustive testing on a daily basis. Software is available on all the sort of major compute platforms on things ranging from laptops all the way up to sort of big cloud deployments. On your laptop, it runs multi-threaded, and if you want to deploy it out to a cloud, you can um, set it up to be using its um, its parallel inter interfaces through MPI to be able to deploy it, um, to be able to do really big jobs um, across a great compute um, thing. It is a it has a graphical user interfaces, which is how most people start to get familiar with the model. But um, once you get past that, you actually start to use the tool frankly, far more as a uh, command line tool that allows you to be able to script it and automate it in a whole variety of ways. And the reality is, is it's, um, it's a, essentially a free tool for users as long as you've come to one of our trainings at some point in time. So there's, there's sort of no license managers, no dongles, no nothing like that. Um, as long as you know how to correctly use the model, you can use this tool on one computer or 100 computers um, and, and even can go with you from employer to employer. My little thing. There we go. So as I said, it's a it's a render and it's a physics-based render. Um, one of the first questions uh, people usually ask is, so what what makes it sort of different? Well, let me start with the things that I think make it the same, which is um, these days DeerSig uses, um, frankly, the same types of rendering techniques that are used in most of the state-of-the-art um, renderers that are used in 
in, in Hollywood, in open source, in commercial, um, and even in many of the gaming engines, which is the fact that DeerSig underneath the hood is a path tracer, which means that from each pixel that we're going to be rendering, we trace out tens, if not hundreds, of rays that head off into the scene to sort of figure out what they're looking at. And each one of those rays um, ends up resulting in a multi-bounce link between the pixel that it's ultimately um, uh, starting from and ultimately will be receiving energy and finding sources of illumination through the scene. So that's why we typically call it an infinite bounce or global illumination type of tool. Um, and these, this is considered the kind of state-of-the-art rendering technique used for physics-based renderers the, um, these days. In terms of what makes it different um, compared to most of the other tools is that it's fully spectral at the core. And what that means is that when we describe scenes and build scene data models, we actually are going to try and um, ideally describe it from the UV all the way out into the long wave infrared. So rather than just picking RGB colors, we actually have to have spectral reflectances and or emissivities for all these materials. It is a physics driven model, which means that underneath the hood, all of the inputs to the model actually have real physical units. And ultimately we're doing absolute radiometry, which is to say that um, when we come up with the solution for a pixel, we actually know what that solution is in terms of things like photons. The Deerstick model itself does not have its own built-in atmospheric radio transfer capabilities. We rely on the true, uh, tried and true tools that are used in the remote sensing community for these things. Uh, most of the time that ends up being the, the Modran radio transfer code that handles how we actually move energy from one location to another location in the scene, how energy from the sun eventually makes it down to the ground, et cetera. Most of the uh, typical rendering tools that most people are familiar with, their primary job is to render 2D ray types of things. In a gaming world, it's, it's trying to render that straight to the screen. Um, for, for Hollywood or commercial rendering, it's maybe uh, rendering 2D frames that are ultimately gonna get put together into some sort of animation or movie format. But in the remote sensing community, we don't actually typically employ 2D types of arrays. We're employing uh, 1D push broom systems that sweep over the scene or even smaller numbers of detectors um, and scan mirror subsystems that are scanning across the screen. Uh, scanning across the scene. Um, the way that detectors get integrated and get read out is also really complicated. And these are all the types of things that we focused on in DeerSig. Because it supports that mid-wave and long wave, that means we have to know the temperatures of things. DeerSig has uh, a couple of different options for built-in temperature calculations. Um, and we have a growing um, suite of plugins that allow us to integrate with uh, third-party uh, temperature prediction codes. And last but not least, and something that we won't get a chance to talk about here today, is that DeerSig does support um, active sensing capabilities in both the RF in terms of radar and in the EO in terms of laser radar. So I just want to return briefly to this idea of spectral materials, because I think it's very important to sort of understand what it takes to be able to build um, scene models that support full um, multispectral and hyperspectral types of renderings. Um, the slide here shows a, um, a rendering of, a, um, of an athletic field on the RIT campus. This uh, main athletic field here is actually an artificial turf, um, and then surrounding it is actually some, some natural grass. And I think anybody who's, who's watched uh, the NFL on Sunday you know, probably recognizes it's, it's actually pretty hard in the visual region to be able to differentiate the artificial surfaces from the actual man-made surfaces. And that's because if you kind of look at the reflectances in these, these wavelengths, they're green. You know, and, and different shades of green could be easily interpreted as just different breeds of grass, et cetera. But if you could look at what grass looks like in, um, in all the other wavelengths, what you would find is that something that's made of plastic looks very different than something that's a biological material that is made of things like water and chlorophyll and cellulose and all these other types of things. So it's really important for us to be able to not just say, well, we kind of know what it looks like in this wavelength region, which means we kind of know what it looks like in other wavelength regions. Um, in the case of DeerSig, we really want to be able to have the, um, the, the full knowledge of what it looks like at all these different wavelengths. <clears throat> so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about how DeerSig is put together because I think it's important to recognize um, uh, or understand how we're deploying it on the rendered AI platform. DeerSig is a plug-in based design, which means that fundamental path tracing capability that allows us to figure out how much light makes it um, you know, to a point in space. Um, is 
wrapped around by a series of plugins that basically create the capability. Um, the most, um, I think, important one or the most um, you know, familiar one for most people is the sensor plugins, which sort of describe what is being collected in the scene. And the sensor plugins are the ones that dictate you know, where I want to look and when I want to look and all those other different types of things. But it also leverages um, a variety of other plugins that provide, and I've only got time to mention a couple of them here, things like how we actually do the radio transfer through the atmosphere, how we actually calculate things like the, the solar and lunar geometry um, for a given point on the planet at a given date and a given time, and also things like weather conditions if we actually are doing something like a temperature calculation. What we've done under the rendered platform is be able to put together a sort of com uh, a custom configuration of a set of plugins that are going to be used so that we can create a capability that is um, easily integratable with the web-based interface and I think provides a, a robust interface for all this sort of data generation stuff that we're talking about here. So on the sensor side, I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about what types of things are typically possible on the sensor plugin. Here, I want to model something like the Worldview 3 satellite system, which has nine channels. It's got a pan channel and then eight um, multispectral channels arranged from the blue out into the near infrared. Uh, on the left side of my, my, uh, my chart here, I've got a, a little plot of what all those look like for Worldview 2. Worldview 3's responses um, ended up being um, almost identical to these, so you can see my nice broad pan channel and all my individual multispectral channels. And that type of data can be directly ingested into GeoSig because we're going to model this spectrally underneath the hood and then integrate all these res against all these responses when everything is said and done. And that allows us to produce with I'm just sort of showing here in our um, in our GUI our nine channel output and I can look at something like the pan or I can look at something like load up the red green and blue channel or even if I want to I can load up um, a color infrared uh, combination in RGB where I'm loading one of the near infrared channels one of the red channels and the uh, green channel so you can load in things like arbitrary shapes here but if you're modeling something like a spectrometer typically instead of those being kind of uniquely shaped those all tend to be sort of regularly shaped something that can be easily um, approximated by something like a, a Gaussian parameterization or a triangular parameterization. And so there's easy ways in the case of a hyperspectral system to be able to bring in those types of responses as well. So in addition to the sensor um, or the camera model itself, the second biggest um, impact on sort of what imagery looks like um, for remote sensing systems is the platform that it's on. Is it on an airborne system? Is it on a, on a spacecraft? In this simulation here, we have a geosig model of planet SkySat system um, looking at the port of Tacoma um, and collecting in a video mode. And so what you'll notice is yeah, the, the scene has some, some dynamics in it. There's uh, vehicles driving around and other machinery doing other types of things. But you'll also notice that during the course of this collection that the perspective of the scene is changing. And that's because the actual spacecraft is descending through its orbit and it's changing its, um, its angle of view onto the scene. And those are the types of things that are typically involved um, in a more traditional Deersig type of a simulation. To go back to one of the other things that Dan brought up earlier, which is that sort of that knowledge and that accuracy types of stuff um, and the ability to do labeling, um, Deersig has a, a fairly sophisticated um, telemetry system that allows a user to pick from nearly 40 different sort of key pieces of information on a per pixel basis that you can request. Um, and the way that that is uh, typically output is as essentially a multi-channel uh, uh, spectral uh, kind of data cube that you can uh, look at in almost any uh, multi-channel image viewer. And the way that I like to think about it is that for each one of those pixels, um, I can drill down through any number of these um, pieces of information in that feature vector and get out information like which material I'm looking at or where that pixel is looking or what the um, solar uh, or what the, yeah, what the, the solar condition is there, am I in shadow or am I um, in the sun, uh, what the atmosphere is there, what the average temperature is, and all those different types of things. And that's very important for both the ability to create uh, training sets um, that have a lot of automatic labeling in them, but also if you ever use uh, this type of a tool for doing um, you know, a test um, to be able to figure out whether your algorithm is triggering on the right thing or calculating the right thing on, um, uh, as part of its product. 
So I'll just show a couple of these really briefly because I think they're very useful for people to sort of see. This is a, a simple RGB image um, of a simulation of a UAV that's sort of low to the ground looking at a, uh, a scene that we developed at one point in time for camouflage concealment detection types of scenarios. So here's what it looks like um, with my simple RGB camera on my drone. But I can also look at the truth data. And this is the plane that tells me what we call the material index. Um, which is literally just a, an index number that we can go back to our material database and tell you, oh, by the way, this pixel is dominated by grass and this pixel is dominated by the, um, by the Humvee material over here. And we can even further break that down with another feature vector um, piece that actually tells us which paint on that material was there. Um, other ones that you got available are things like the, the sun fraction, and that is a fraction because a pixel doesn't necessarily need to be either fully uh, illuminated or fully shadowed from the sun. Once you get to you know fairly large pixels, it's almost um, it's almost uncommon to have a, a pixel that's either fully illuminated or fully shadowed. Um, and then one of the other more interesting ones. Um, and I should point out, this is not something that's directly used um, in the Dirichlet physics calculations, but sort of just a piece of telemetry that we can um, sort of capture um, as part of the um, of the calculation. Is basically what we would consider um, a sky fraction map. So it's telling us for each uh, image or each pixel in the image how much sky would be visible if you um, um, if you were at that location. Um, and these are the types of things that sometimes just help in physics understanding um, and phenomenology understanding when you're um, when you're working with more advanced algorithms. So the last thing I just want to draw some attention to is that typically or historically what DeerSig was used for was sort of very low level types of sensor modeling. Uh, as I said, people trying to design new sensors and figure out what the impacts were going to be of choosing one lens over another lens or one integration time over another integration time. Um, and so the sensor uh, modeling capabilities that are in there include a lot of things like doing um, color filter arrays, such as bear patterns or true sense patterns, the ability to, um, to uh, control to, um, to quite an extensive um, extent um, how detectors, um, how an entire array is integrated and read out. So you might have something like a global shutter versus a rolling shutter uh, type of trade that you want to do to be able to incorporate the MTF of the optical system that might have um, different types of, of optics in it. Is, a, is it a traditional cassegrain grain telescope or is it some sort of more exotic type of a telescope? And how does the MTF of that ultimately impact the image quality? To be able to put in things like lens distortions in the cases of optical systems as we move to sort of more and more of these compact uh, systems like we see on a lot of these CubeSats, things like lens distortions can be a little bit more important and the variability in lens distortions from, from camera to camera when you're trying to integrate um, imagery from multiple systems is a bigger problem. And ultimately down at the, um, at the lowest level, if you really wanna be able to control things like the response of each individual detector on the focal plane in terms of its sensitivity, its amplification, its noise, et cetera, you can kind of do all those types of things. <clears throat> But the last thing I'm going to talk about here is really sort of what we've been trying to tackle in terms of integration with the rendered AI um, platform. And for uh, many users, um, you know, uh, they're they're not necessarily familiar with how something like a um, like a sensor is actually operated by the by the owner. Um, they're not necessarily familiar with the fact that there's various levels of data that you might be working at. The reality is that most users are working at fairly high level data, but if you happen to be one of these sensor providers, then you might be interested in simulating data at some of these other levels. So level zero is sort of the bread and butter of what DeerSig had normally been used for, which is to simulate that fundamental signal, how many photons are coming off of the detectors and so forth. And sometimes the simulations that DeerSig does at this level aren't even things that can be visualized as an image right away. They actually have to um, have that data be shuffled and sort of uh, you know, put into some sort of a format that can actually be looked at. Um, <clears throat> And that's the type of data that you would, might see at level one, where you've actually gone through some of the basic imagery construction, some of the calibration, and some of those types of things. And slowly, as we move up this processing chain, some of this types of stuff might be done on the vehicle these days. Some of this might be done on the ground. We're slowly creating a higher and higher value type of data product. So once we go from something that basically looks like an image, we might go to something where um, I've got, uh, I know how many photons arriving at the aperture versus I know how many photons are actually leaving the the ground. Um, I've actually maybe got these images tied to the ground so I know where they are. Maybe if I'm doing multi-look processing from one or more sensors, I have, um, I've combined all that type of data together. The point is 
that a lot of this processing when we're using commercial assets is something that we as users know nothing about. And even us as modelers almost know nothing about. Um, and so what we wanted to sort of point out to users um, or people sort of listening in here today is that what we're trying to tackle on the rendered AI platform is the fact that um, we're trying to create the ability for users to be able to simulate sort of the type of data that they typically, that they typically would get from data providers. Um, using um, uh, models that we're approximating for those processing steps that we have no knowledge of um, for a lot of these sort of commercial uh, types of systems that are available out there. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt to talk a little bit more about how things get integrated. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Scott and Dan. Um, to try to uh, take control here. I think, I, uh, I, think, I think I'm doing it. I think, I think it just stops sharing, so. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, oh. Are you, there we go. <clears throat> Great. So um, yeah, I um, I get to uh, talk about the fun stuff of um, what, what, we, what the benefits are of connecting these two technologies. Um, Let's see here. So, um, you know, as Dan pointed out, uh, Rendered AI is a uh, um, platform as a service that runs synthetic data applications with data set management. Um, we provide uh, professional services uh, to set up um, uh, your, your channels, as we call them. So we have some uh, application development uh, professional services and also expertise on staff to um, build out 3D assets and domain adaptation models. And then on the other side, um, DeerSig went through, or uh, Scott went through the DeerSig um, fully mature physics-based simulator with um, all these useful features. And uh, I listed here some of the ones I've had the opportunity to, to build out. And um, the list is, is quite a bit longer than this. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you pointed out, um, Scott, that uh, that it is kind of plug-in driven and configuration driven. So the integra the integration is actually um, pretty pretty transparent, and we're able to rely on the uh, the DeerSig documentation for for our customers. Um, so in in terms of the uh, what, what what this integrated offering features is um, the power of rendered with uh, graph nodes that expose and hide re relevant features for the, the specific use case. So um, what do I mean by that? Um, the stochastic runs of a, uh, of a, of a graph are, um, can be configured and um, built out with, uh, with, with, this, with a graphical user interface. And that uh, makes it super easy for uh, computer vision scientists and data engineers to um, iterate on the data and have kind of a mental map of what of what um, a, a particular data set is going to have is going to contain. Um, additionally, the apps are they are software apps and they rely on um, uh, like the software lifecycle of a of a software engineering process. So there's a, you know, so um, a company can build out the, uh, you know, they, they can follow their standard process of pull requests and QA testing and make sure that when the user um, creates different scenarios that the, um, the errors are minimized. Um, and also uh, we all, you know, rendered provides a compute environment. So um, the disk amount can be scaled and runs can be run in parallel. So, um, so, so you get you get the benefit of of not having to um, worry about the the compute side. Uh, I, another one thing I won't be highlighting here is um, that rendered provides the opportunity to drop in models. So um, it's uh, beneficial for users to maybe take a pre-built bundle from the DeerSig uh, pre-built. Uh, assets or build their own 
bundles as, as they're defined by Deer SIG and then drop them in and have a node ready to just add to a graph. So um, the demo that I'll be showing is for uh, general uses. And um, the, the, so the, the five scene nodes that are built into the demo, um, I list here. Um, all of these descriptions are built into the channel. Um, so uh, I wanted to call out that uh, the mega scene one from, from Deer Sig, for those of you who are familiar, is just uh, a node in the graph. And mega scene two, the, the Trona industrial scene is, is a graph and, or is a node and, and uh, various other uh, scenes are, are, are built into it. Similarly, for, for the, the platform nodes, um, there's uh, three Earth observation platforms at different resolutions that are um, simplified arrays of uh, well-known vehicles and spectrometers with uh, the representative um, GSD values. Um, the frame array approximation is, is arbitrary, but uh, gives um, just a, a quick view of, and of the results that you, that you can get. The, um, the, the Avaris HSI um, approximation has uh, two different altitudes because that spectrometer can be attached to different vehicles. So there's a sat there's kind of a, a satellite and a, uh, and a and a aircraft option at 20 kilometers and four kilometers. So um, so the, the this uh, kind of general purpose channel that I'll be showing um, allows for that variability. And there's a drone node as well that is just a 35 millimeter camera that we can fly at various altitudes and look angles. So um, the, uh, the the here here comes the demo. Uh, the content that you'll see here can be accessed by using what we call co a content code. When you so when you create a workspace. Um, it, on in your in your account, you can you, there's an option to enter a content code, and when you do that, the um, this this it'll be preloaded with these um, with this content. So uh, Dan, can you uh, give me the thumbs up that I'm sharing my screen? Or uh, I, I so I, I'm. I, I think I'm sharing the uh, the website now. You are, yep. Yeah. Double thumb, double thumbs up. <laughs> great, great. Thanks. So, um, yeah, this is just a, a new account that I created yesterday for this purpose, and um, entered the content code. And this is what it looks like. It's just called Deer Seek General as a workspace. And for any given workspace, there's for those of you who aren't familiar with rendered, uh, the high level workspace view shows you your limits and recent. Um, stats, but the kind of the best view to see these um, these graphs are, are are from this graphs tab. So uh, this workspace has several graphs that illustrate um, generation of NV data cubes and uh, with various truth assets. Um, the uh, I'll, I'll just go left to right here. So um, so I'll go through these um, these. Well, they're not quite in the order expected, but uh, the, the the Earth observation uh, platforms first. So this is the high res. Uh, this so this graph has the high res um, platform in there, and uh, there's a there's a preview option that to um, to get a sense for what the graph can generate. Uh, let's see here. So. In particular, for this um, graph, I wanted to call out that there's two truth collections that are available. Um, you can gather the intersection values in the truth masks or the geolocation. And um, the atmosphere is fixed as a summer atmosphere with urban aerosols at 30 kilometer visibility. But this <clears throat> the scan center is randomized. So when when runs are done, with this graph, you'll get um, for a fixed app for a fixed um, atmosphere, various views of, of the scene. 
in the, uh, the, the medium res earth observation platform where we're, we're looking at the, the Trona scene and, um, and this one, the re the atmospheres are randomized. Huh. Well, or they're supposed to be. So, um, so here the, um, the simulate node will, will choose one of these branches and then um, it'll either grab from this winter atmosphere one of these random conditions or from the summer atmosphere one of these random conditions and then um, the, 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 the scene center will be fixed for this uh, graph and um, it's it's configured so that the, the geolocation um, truth collector is uh, disabled and one reason might be that um, People are concerned of disk space. So for every every um, truth collector that's on, you get another another channel, so to speak, and uh, of of data that's stored. And um, it's it's so sometimes you might want to turn them off. Um, Deer Sig supports many uh, Deer, uh, truth options, and I just have some examples at, uh, added in to these some typical use examples that you might have. So now into the low res earth observation Tahoe scene, we have a, uh, um, uh, this is an approximation of the super dove um, spectrometer and um, it's, uh, it's approximated it in a frame array like we do. The, um, I just wanted to point out that the tool tips are here to show you exactly what um, the spectrometer does and what the estimated uh, GSD is. And then um, for for this platform, we expose the uh, reference date time because it's not necessarily in a sun synchronous orbit and then give the user the option to collect the, the shadow information. Um, for this one, the, the scene center is randomized and the summer or and atmosphere is fixed. And I will um, show you the results of these graphs uh, next, but right now I just want to show you the variety that's built into the, um, the shared channel. So I think next I wanted to go to the medium, so number to the HSIs. So here's the medium HSI, medium res. So um, this one has a random uh, location of the the scan center fixed atmosphere and is uh, an HSI spectrometer that is uh, flown at four kilometer altitude. So this one's cl closer to the ground than the, than the, than the, the low res one will be. And again, um, because it's flown on a, an aircraft, um, I, we expose the, the date time in the shadow. And just about in by HSI, we mean hyper hyperspectral. Mm -hmm. Some acronyms. Yeah. So, yeah. So this one's a fun one. Um, these are the croplands over Denver, where we have different crops that are uh, associated. Different types of crop materials are ascribed to different fields, and one um, customer has taken the the. Um, opportunity to randomize which uh, crops are associated with which field. So, um, so that would be that's a, an example that of how maybe a, pro, um, a node like this could be expanded. Uh, otherwise, it's the same as the other one. Um, the the location is Denver. It's randomized. The summer's fi the atmosphere is fixed. Uh, one idea that I had was to um, add a random date. You know, if um, if you wanted to. If you wanted to uh, just get, uh, depending on you know what what your training needs are, it's possible that you could randomize this this daytime value, and, or uh, just like, like I was saying, and also the with the scene we could add some inputs here to randomize the the materials. So um, for any given run, oh yeah, one more. How can I forget my drone? Uh, so we have the Harvard Forest scene, uh, care of RIT. And um, with this one, 
I'm going to uh, randomize the atmosphere. But mo most importantly, the, um, the, the drone is flown um, at 50, I have it at 50 degrees look angle and a uh, random platform azimuth. And I have a random integer node here to set the flight altitude between 100 and 600 meters. And this one also has a, a specific date time that could be adjusted. Um, so the way that uh, the platform works is you can you can preview a, a scene like I was doing with the, before, or um, stage a graph if maybe you change something that you wanted to see a little bit differently. Uh, maybe I wanted to to fix the uh, the the time and and only look at maybe like seven at night or something like that and, see, and try to get some some more maybe my computer model is not uh, detecting very well with particular level of shadow or something like that so we can make that change stage the graph come over to the jobs and then um, adjust this uh, name to reflect 1930 or some um, whatever kind of is meaningful to you and then um, have the opportunity to, to run as many of these as we would like. Kick, kick off the job. And then when the jobs are done, um, they show up in the library. So uh, this uh, pre-built channel, uh, a workspace comes with all of those graphs pre-run. So, um, so the, the, the drone over the forest at 50 degrees with the random height um has uh these has um the the data envy cubes uh the you know the data cube <laughs> the envy data cubes and the truth data are uh available for download or access through the sdk but um i go ahead and generate a, a preview for for each of them so that the platform can kind of give you a sense for what's what's going to be in that data set um and then similarly for for the other channels, we have uh, various scenes here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I can go to questions. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I'll just show this lot. Here's the RIT canvas. Yeah, you get the idea. Load it up, go get an account. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, so we'll show you there um, in the last slide the uh, the sign up link so that um, you can get a, a developer account and start, start playing with this for free. Let me share back the slides. Uh, but while I do that, uh, do we have any questions that we can uh, get to now? Bunch. You're familiar with this doing your training all the time, Scott, right? It takes <laughs> people over a minute to get started. So one one thing uh, that I'll point out that that some of our um, you know customers ask about is is how we can get how they can get started with with this. Um, this application, or specifically an application that that they have for uh, for remote sensing synthetic data generation. So um, we have the content code that allows you to get started right away um, with some various examples. Um, but if you have a specific example, uh, we rendered works with uh, with our customers to build out uh, these channels, or which is our term of art for the specific. Um, 
the specific applications for your use case. So we will work with you to to as sort of the the synthetic data engineers to uh, build out the, that uh, application, deploy it to the to the platform, and then allow you to uh, expose or, or um, hide any of those uh, specific. Um, parameters that are are important for your for your use case so um, from there we can we can share with you the, the capability to customize um, and uh, and configure and, and generate as much data as you need to to get your um, application uh, or your use case off the ground so Unless you may have a question um, about the scene. Um, sorry, my terminology went up. In the node, you had the scenes and you had the drop downs from these different. Can you talk a little bit about generating those or getting new scenes into this, into those nodes? And, and can you can you base it off other imagery that you might have acquired with like real real imagery as a starting point? Or how does that that node work? Yeah. So I could I could start off and then maybe. Uh... Then maybe Matt and Scott could could uh, fill in, but yeah, we we work with our customers as well to um, to configure specific scene um, requirements. So if you have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the need for an urban scene with certain types of aerosols or you know these certain types of of specific um, objects of interest that you're looking for, uh, we can help you to to build out that scene, we, we can help to build out that scene or help you to build that, that out um, and then deploy that as well as a as um, a um, kind of a scenario to in in the back end of the of that channel. Yeah, and we yeah. can. Yeah, go that's ahead, right. We, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, that's so the there's the, either we can um, scope it out and Use our, our, you know, our, um, our, our agency of, of uh, experts, or um, you can, or, or we can talk you through, or you know, kind of, if you have the deer sig chops on hand, then um, you know, then we, that's kind of a, that's the alternative to, um, for, for our, for the different relationships that we have with, with the customers. Yeah, I think one of the challenges we've historically had with, with how to, how to make scenes is um a chicken and the egg problem it's like well i, I want to have you know uh high resolution hsi high spatial resolution and high spectral resolution hsi data well how do you how do you make a scene like that where that sensor is going to be the first of its kind you know you don't have like other data to sort of see to it so a lot of the scene construction methodologies that we use have been challenged by those types of, of problems over the years and so we try to come up with uh, techniques that allow us to fuse high spatial resolution data with maybe high um, spectral resolution, um, you know, point data and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's there's a there's a lot of uh, just like in the in the traditional 3D you know uh, rendering community there's a there's a lot of craftsmanship that frankly goes into a lot of scene construction set. I was just watching one of the Marvel movies over the weekend, and you know you get to the point where it's like you know in the credits where they're they're you know listing, listing all the digital artists and it just goes on and on and on um i think one of the, the things that we have to try to solve on the remote sensing side of that industry is to figure out how to not spend a hundred million dollars to build scenes by employing you know uh, entire um you know uh you know warehouses full of people to to do it and come up with uh, far more automated types of of um of techniques and it's part of the reason why sometimes scenes in their first cuts look sort of cartoonish is because they haven't had all that sort of craftsmanship um, even though you're using physical values it's recognizing that oh well there's there's sort of this other little bit of, of information that hasn't been uh, incorporated yet and that needs to be incorporated to be able to make something where you're actually using physical measurements to actually look like you would expect it to yeah and then just to to kind of round that all out um, we will often work with our customers you know, depending on their needs, and you mentioned if there's a, a real world area that you're interested in, we can uh, look to to use existing real world real world data to to populate that, 
or if it's more just a, a kind of a hypothetical scenario and uh, a real world location is not um, specifically important, we can use procedural tools to build out a kind of a, a geotypical hypothetical scenario um, with still with those um, those material properties and emissivity values that are important to getting the, those correct um, those correct um, uh, reflectance values. Cool. So, any other questions before we wrap up? That was a good one, Anne. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, just to wrap up, I wanted to say thank you all for attending. Um, maybe we're excited to kind of get this get this partnership out uh, into the world and and to support future use cases uh, uh, with this integration. Um, please feel free to to sign up to uh, for a trial at uh, with rendered AI. You can use that content code that we shared here. Uh, it's dear sig v2. Um, and we can type that into the chat so you can copy that as well. Uh, but uh, then feel free to reach out if you have any uh, any questions or um, uh, any needs that we can help you out with. So. Anything else from uh, you, Matt or Scott, bef before we sign off? Thanks for the opportunity. Yep. Good to talk to everybody. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And there they all go.